Good evening. Glad all of you could be here tonight. Um, those of you that are here in person and those that may be joining us online, we're, what, we're glad you could join us as well. Um, we're in the last stages of our Wednesday night series for the summer. Uh, we've got three more after this in our series called Miraculous. And tonight we have somebody that really doesn't need an introduction, uh, one of our own, I would say, Tim Agee. Uh, we certainly know Tim and his wife, Olivia, and their daughter, daughters, Kate and Sarah. Um, you may or may not know that uh, after a career in IT and consulting, recently uh, Tim retired from his corporate career to pursue ministry opportunities, and he's currently the pulpit minister for the Pleasant View Church of Christ in Pleasant View, Tennessee. So we certainly know about Tim and his knowledge of the scriptures and his speaking ability, so we know we've got a, a treat in for us tonight. Before I turn it over to him, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for the, the refreshing rain that you've sent for us. We're thankful for your son that you sent for us, Father, and the grace and mercy you showed and your love for us through that great gift. And we're thankful for him and for his blood that cleanses us from our sins. Father, we're, uh, we pray tonight for Tim as he leads us in a study of one of your son's miracles. And we pray that uh, we will glean from it something that will benefit us in our life. Father, be with us tonight and be with us throughout the rest of our days. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Good evening. That was pretty pitiful. I mean, I've been gone for just a year, and you've already forgotten how to... How are we doing? Good? All right, there we go. Now you're awake. Now you can go to sleep. I'll give you plenty of time to sleep now. If you have a Bible, turn to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. I know as Mike just alluded to that you've been going through a series on the miracles of Jesus, and... This particular miracle is, uh, we'll talk in just a minute about the, the parallel passages that where this is found, but uh, tonight we're going to look at the healing of the, the paralytic man in Mark chapter 2. And I want to start off just reading 
the 12 verses that kind of make up this story. Uh, and then we'll kind of pull back and, and hit, hit some of the main ideas that we can learn from this, okay? Fair enough. So I encourage you to grab a Bible or your phone or whatever, wherever you can get to, to Scripture, and let's go through this together. It says, and when he returned to Capernaum, now I'm going to stop. I, I said I was going to read it, but I, I lied. I'm going to do a little side, side road here. Um, Capernaum, if you read in Matthew's account, in Matthew 9, Capernaum, uh, Matthew referred to it as uh, his own city uh, in this same story. Now, the reason why Matthew called it his own city was that when Jesus left Nazareth, which was his true hometown, uh, he, his, his base of operations for his ministry uh, which most of it occurred in the region of Galilee, was the city of Capernaum. Uh, and if you've ever been to Capernaum today, which you can go to the archaeological site, the very first thing you see is, you know, Capernaum, the hometown of Jesus, big sign. Um, so this was his kind of adopted hometown. And the reason why Mark begins by saying he had returned to Capernaum, you know, Mark, like unlike Matthew and Luke, the other two synoptic or synoptic gospels that have similar stories in them and structure, uh, Mark doesn't have much of an introduction in far as his his early life and birth. He just kind of jumps right into his ministry. And in chapter one, we're introduced to him being in Capernaum, drawing a crowd. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But then he begins, you know, evangelizing around Galilee. So now at the beginning of chapter two. He's back in Capernaum, okay? So it says he returned to Capernaum after some days. It was reported that, he, that maybe he was in the home of Peter and Andrew. Uh, again, back in chapter 1, we can read about him teaching in the synagogue. And then after teaching in the synagogue, he went to the home of Peter and Andrew. And in that occasion, he actually healed uh, Peter's mother-in-law. Uh, and so, so whether this was his own home or the home of Peter and Andrew, we don't know. But he was in a home. It says, And many were gathered together, so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Someone Assuming to put themselves in the position of God would be considered, that was not God, would be considered blasphemy. And so the scribes, we'll talk more about this later, but they're thinking, it's in their heart, he's blaspheming. He's making himself God, so he's blaspheming. Uh, so, who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins... He said to the paralytic, which is an almost parenthetical expression here, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Brothers and sisters, there's two things I see in this story, two huge ideas that I see in this story. And in my notes, I, the titles of sermons rarely are anything significant. I know the title of the series is Miraculous. What I have in my notes for the title of this sermon is Power and Faith. And those are the two concepts I want us to look at tonight. First, I want us to talk about power. I see in this story an incredible demonstration of power. Now, you may be going, well, Tim, this is a miracle. 
He made a lame man, a paralyzed man, get up and walk out the door. Of course, this is a story about power. But there's so much more in this story that demonstrates the power of Jesus, the power of the Son of God, than just him healing the paralytic. So much bigger than that. And so let's look through this, again, very short story at the signs that we see that show us the incredible power that Jesus had and continues to have. Okay? Make sense? Fair enough? The first thing with regard to power that I have written in my notes is it comes from verse 2, and I have in my notes written this phrase, author of truth. Author of truth. Why do I have that in my notes? Because this is what it says in verse 2. It says, And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. Now, you may go, well, okay, well, what does that, what does that have to do with power? Well, it's significant to me that, that Jesus was, it says that he was preaching the word. Because if I take a step back and go, well, what word is he preaching? He's preaching God's word. He's preaching, as we know throughout his earthly ministry, he was teaching about the kingdom of God. But who is Jesus? He is God. He is the author and the single source of the truth that he is teaching. The the teaching that he is giving to them through his preaching, he is the source of it. You know, when I get up and preach, I am drawing from the source and relaying it. It's not coming directly from the source. When Jesus was in that room teaching, it was coming straight, as we say, straight from the horse's mouth, right? It was straight from the, the, the author of that truth. No one else in the history of the universe has ever, has ever delivered truth directly from themselves. You know, uh, I was just talking about Capernaum in the land of Israel today. Another thing in the land of Israel, the Jordan River, very famous place uh, in Scripture. Not a very mighty river. It's actually a very small river, uh, more like a creek. But, but the Jordan River as we know it is made up of four tributaries. A tributary, what does that mean? That's a source. There are four smaller Rivers, creeks, springs that come from the foothills of Mount Hermon that feed into the single river that we know of as the Jordan River. So when you say, hey, the entirety of the Jordan River is made up of four different sources, that's not true when it comes to truth. Truth has one source, and that one source was sitting right there in their midst. And one thing you notice about this story is there was a great crowd that was in the house. And it says so much so that you couldn't even get in the door. Now, I think, you know, throughout the ministry of Jesus that you read in the Gospels, there's almost always a crowd with him. And there were a lot of reasons why people were following him. I don't think it was just one reason. You know, you had individuals like the scribes who are central to this story, the scribes and Often they're referred to with the Pharisees, the Pharisees who were the teachers of the law. The scribes were the ones who, who copied the law. And, but they were not there because they recognized him as being the single source of truth. Or they were not there because they recognized him as being the Messiah. No, they were there because they recognized him as being a threat and they were trying to find a way to take him out. You had others that were there because he had been performing miracles. I mean, and these were not miracles like we have from TV preachers, you know, today where you go, oh, you cured me of my migraines. It's something we can't ever see. No, he's, he's taking blind folks and now they can see. He's taking those that have been lame their entire lives and making them where they can walk. It's something that you can see. And so people were following him because of that. But then there was a third reason. And that's because when he taught, it wasn't like anyone else. Go with me in your Bible back to the book of Mark. I mean, we're in Mark, but back to chapter 1. 
chapter 1. I had just mentioned this, that back in chapter 1, he had been teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. And it says in verse 21 of chapter 1, when they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. Now listen to verse 22. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority. He said his teaching is different. Well, of course it was different because he was the source of what he was teaching. It was his message. He was delivering the truth in the Gospel of John later in the life of Jesus. Near the end of his life, in the the last hours before his life ended on the cross, when he was in the upper room with his disciples. He's having the last meal with them. And he's talking to them about how he's, he's leaving and he's going somewhere where they don't know where he's going and, and that they need to follow him. And, he's, and Thomas is like, well, how are we going to follow you if we don't know the way? And what Thomas was looking for was uh, like, a, like a GPS coordinates. You know, like, hey, hey, give me some turn-by-turn directions. And what does Jesus say? You're missing it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The definite article, the, means there's one. There's one way, there's one truth, there's one life. Jesus says, I'm the only way, the only truth, the only way to eternal life. So don't miss in this story that when Jesus is preaching the word to them, he is preaching them the word as the source of that truth. That's powerful because only God can claim that. Right? Only God can claim to be the author of truth. The next thing that I see in this story, after uh, after the idea of being the author of truth, comes in verse 5. And that is, I have written in my notes, the authority to forgive. The authority to forgive. Now, I'm skipping over a little bit. And the reason why I'm doing that is because that's going to come at the end when we talk about faith about these, these five men, the four men who were carrying the paralyzed man and the paralyzed man, that's five. I think my math is right there. But there's five, and we see a demonstration of their faith. But then after they make it into the room, it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. And again, I have in my notes, if I didn't say it earlier, I have authority to forgive. The second demonstration of his power. Have you ever read this story and thought, why did he start there? I mean, what was the reason why the man was there, the paralytic, but also why the four friends who had gone through so much to get him there, what was the reason? It's because he was paralyzed, right? He had a physical need. He had a physical need that they wanted him to be able to walk. And Jesus, upon seeing this man, the first thing he says is, Son, your sins are forgiven. Why did he start there? You know, I was, I was as I always do, even though I've, you know, I've known this story since I was a little kid, I always go back through and dig through the commentaries. Like, is there something I'm missing here? First commentary I opened, not one I normally use, but first commentary I opened said this, said, Well, clearly his physical ailment had to have something to do with sin that was present in his life. And I'm going, wait a minute. You remember in John 9, the Gospel of John, when you have the... Turn there. Turn there. We got time. Turn there. John 9, again, still during the ministry of Jesus. John 9. This is when Jesus was in Jerusalem, which, again, most of his earthly ministry, he was in Galilee, but this is when Jesus was in Jerusalem. It says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, okay? And the disciples asked him, Rabbi, Rabbi just means teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. And again, I look at this story in Mark 2 and go, I don't see any direct connection between the sin and the paralysis. So if there's not a connection there, why did Jesus start there? Because Jesus recognized what his biggest need was. Again, why is he there? He's there because of the paralysis. He can't walk. 
And maybe to him, that's what he thought or the friends thought. This is the biggest thing he needs in his life. Jesus knew better. How did he know better? Well, you could say, well, he's Jesus. He knew everything. Absolutely. But what is a universal truth about everyone who's ever lived on this earth other than Jesus? Our number one need is to be forgiven of sin. And so Jesus not only is forgiving this man of his sin, which, by the way, came from a demonstration of faith, which again we'll talk about later. But he's also demonstrating to everyone there that the, re, you know, the reason why I know he needs it is because we all need it. You all need it. You all need to be forgiven of your sins. And that's powerful because he's the only one that can do it. Just like he's the only one that can deliver the truth, he's the only one that can deliver forgiveness. The only one who can deliver forgiveness. You know, this idea of everyone, everyone needs it. You know, my favorite book in the Bible is the letter to the Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans. I, I've joked before that if, if a church would pay me to just camp out and just teach that class, just Romans, over and over and over again, I'd be happy to do that the rest of my life. I love it so much. The first three chapters of Romans, Paul's writing to people he's never met. And he spends three chapters telling them, all of us, Gentile first, then Jew, we're all dead in our sins. And when he gets to the end of verse 20, when he gets to the end of verse 20, we're all, we're all dead and without hope. Because he says you can't possibly keep enough commandments to, be, to save yourself because the very law you would try to follow tells you that you can't do it. And then he summarizes that a few verses later in verse 23 when he says, For all have sinned, using a form of the Greek that shows continual action. We continue to sin and fall short of the glory of God. Jesus knew that that man needed forgiveness more than he needed physical healing. He knew that. Why? Because we all need it. And Jesus, in, in offering that forgiveness, demonstrated his power in that just like he's the only source of truth, he's also the only source of forgiveness. You know, I won't go read this, but in the Hebrew letter, the Hebrews letter, I guess if I'm being technically correct, the Hebrews letter, the writer, you know, says that, that the, the old covenant had no, no way... To forgive sins. You know, you had to keep on sacrificing over and over and over again. But now with the new covenant, we have, we have a Savior. We have a Messiah who died one time for all time. In the book of Acts in chapter 4, this is one chapter removed from Peter and John healing another time when a paralytic man was healed, but a lame man was healed who for his entire life had been begging at the gate called Beautiful, which was the gate that was in the court of the Gentiles that separated the court of the Gentiles from the court of the women just outside the temple. And he was there begging every day. And Peter and John heal him and they preach a message. And what happens? They're arrested. They're arrested. Now, this comes probably not long after the day of Pentecost. And Pentecost was 50 days after Passover. And what was Peter doing around Passover? Peter was telling everybody who listened to him, I don't have any idea who that man is that's in there in front of the Sanhedrin. I have no idea who he is. 50 days later, Peter's in front of the Sanhedrin. He's seen the risen Jesus now. He watched him ascend into heaven in Acts chapter 1. And Peter is asked, by whose authority did you do this? Acts chapter 4 he says, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. It's quite a transformation in 50 days, isn't it? By the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And listen to this in verse 12. There is no salvation, I'm sorry, there is salvation in no one else. So Jesus forgives this man of his sins and there's no other one who has ever lived on this earth who could do that. That is a demonstration of his power. Only God could do that. The next thing, the next thing I have written in my notes comes from verses 6 through 8. And I have this written down as ability to see. 
ability to see. Verse 6, it says, Now some of the scribes, and I mentioned that before, you know, the scribes are hanging out there. I don't think they're there because they want to be disciples. I think they are there because they're looking for somehow to get rid of this guy who's a threat to their way of life, their way of religion. It says, The scribes were sitting there questioning. Now, I don't know if you've ever read this story and thought that the scribes and Jesus were having a conversation. But they weren't. They weren't having a conversation. What the scribes, what comes after this was in their heart. It says questioning in their hearts. They were thinking this. It says, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Again, none of this is being said out loud. Mark says it's in their hearts. They're thinking it. And immediately, Jesus perceiving in his spirit that they thus question within themselves. That's a fancy way of saying he knew what they were thinking. He could see past the physical into their heart, into their spirit. He knew what they were thinking. And so as a response, he says, why do you question these things in your hearts? Jesus' sight is not limited like our sight is limited. Why? Why? Because he's God. He's all-powerful. You know, I, I have terrible vision. Um, I don't say that to complain. I also don't say that to brag. Uh, it's just a fact. I have awful vision. It's corrected. I have, wear contacts, but without my contacts, uh, my vision, I asked my eye doctor this the last time I was there because I haven't asked since I was a little kid, and I asked him what it was. He said it's 2,800 without contacts. Now, if you don't know what that means, who in here has 20 to uncorrected 2020 vision? Okay, Kyla. So let me tell you what 2800 means. If we had something projected on this screen and I were standing 20 feet away from that screen without my contacts on, I would see it exactly the same as Kyla standing 800 feet away. That's two and two thirds football fields, again, if my math is correct. So I have terrible vision. Really bad. The last time I went to the eye doctor's office, I go every year. Normally my procedure when I get an annual exam, I'm sure many of you have been through this. I've been doing it since I was tiny. But I go in there and the first thing they do is, ha is give me an eye test with my contacts in. And then they have me take my contacts out and the doctor comes in and does the full exam. That's the normal procedure. This last time... There was a, a, a new medical assistant that came out to get me, and she, the first thing she asked me to do, she's like, hey, take your contacts out. And I'm like, huh, that's, that's different. So I took my contacts out, and she sat me in the chair. She said, all right, now tell me what's the lowest line you can read on the chart. Now, the chart is a projected white screen with black letters. I don't, I don't even see any black, much less a line. I cannot even perceive the color black. And she's, I said, I, I can't see the chart. She goes, no, seriously, what's the lowest line you can read? And I said, no, seriously, I don't see any black at all. And she's just like, no, come on, stop messing with me. What's the lowest line you can see? And I, well, this goes on for like what feels like, like five minutes. And finally, I can tell this blur walks across me and is standing in front of me. And after about a minute or two, I said, are you holding up your fingers or something? And she said, yeah, but you're not answering. I go... I just guessed. I have no idea what you're doing. I can't even see your arms. I just see this blob in front of me. I have no idea what you're doing. And finally she gave up and she said, fine, I'll just let the doctor deal with you. And she walked out. <laughs> now that, that was hopefully to wake up some of you. But the point is, I have really bad vision. But even those that have 20-20 vision like Kyla, we can't see beyond the physical, Right? We have no idea what, what, we can't see what's on someone's heart. We can't hear what's in someone's mind. We have no way to know those things. But Jesus does. Jesus knew. Jesus knew. And just like he's the only source of truth, the only one who has ever lived on this earth, just like he's the only one that's ever been on this earth who could forgive sins, He's the only one who has ever lived on this earth who could see past the physical and see what was on someone's heart. That also is a demonstration of power. You remember going back to the Gospel of John. You remember in the Gospel of John when Jesus 
was with the woman of Samaria at the well. Do you remember what he said to her kind of midway through that conversation? Go get your husband and bring him here. You remember that? And Jesus was using that to kind of set up, a situ- uh, set up the conversation because she said, well, I don't have a husband. And he's like, yeah, you're right. You've had five and now you don't have one. And later on, she said, when she's introducing him to her village, what does she say? He told me everything that I've ever done, even though he'd never met her. How did he know that? Because he could see past the physical. He didn't have to have physically met her before he knew her. He knew everything about her because he is God. He is God. He is the source of truth. He he is the, the only one who can forgive. And he is, he is the only one who knows what's, on, knows what's on people's hearts, what's on people's mind, the ability to see. The final thing that I have with regard to power, and this comes from verses 9 through 12. And I have this phrase written for 9 through 12 in my notes, affirmation of divinity. Affirmation of divinity. And this is the miracle. This is the miracle. But it's about, the miracle is about way more than just healing a paralytic. I mean, clearly that's important for that man's physical needs. But it's about so much more than that. Look at the conversation that he he begins. This is an actual conversation now. After he's been reading what's on their hearts, now he has an actual conversation with the scribes. He says, Which is easier? Now remember, they had been questioning him. They said, hey, you're a blasphemer. They're thinking that. You're a blasphemer because only God can forgive sins. You are putting yourself in the place of God. That makes you a blasphemer. And so he says, all right, which one's easier? Which one's easier? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven? He'd already said that. Or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Anyone who has ever lived, who has the ability to speak, can say those two phrases. You can say those two phrases. And you can't physically see the result of the forgiveness of sins. It's not like all of a sudden you had a black flag sticking up and your sins are forgiven and it goes down and a white flag comes up. It doesn't work like that, right? We can't physically see that. It is an incredible act of power to have your sins forgiven, but you can't fit. There's no physical indication that it's happened, right? Does that make sense? Some of you are looking at me like, what are you talking about? Right? Right? You don't see the forgiveness of sins. But if you say, get up and walk, the person either gets up and walks or they don't, right? They either get up and walk or they don't. Again, I can say it all day long. I could have somebody that can't walk, and I could say all day long, get up and walk, and they're never going to get up and walk, right? But what Jesus is doing is he's saying, I'm going to prove to you that what you couldn't see actually happened and that I have the authority to do it. I'm going to prove to you by doing something that is impossible for man, just like forgiveness is, but something that you can see. Something that you can see. So he says, which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk. But, here's that explanation. That you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Why is he, why is he healing this man? He says, I'm doing it to, to show you that I do have the authority to forgive sins. I have that authority. You couldn't see it, so now I'm going to show it to you. Now I'm going to show you that I have that authority. You know, I, I, I was thinking about the concept of authority uh, earlier today, and it came, I was thinking about my, my corporate career, which I left last year, and I was, I don't know, I, I don't know why I was thinking about this, but, but I was thinking about, um, with the idea of authority, that one of the coolest things, if somebody ever said, hey, Tim, list out all the neat things that you got to do in your career. Probably number one on my list would be that for a five-year period, 
I had access, authority, whatever you want to call it, to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. As part of a five-year project I did for the New York Stock Exchange, I had access. And while that's not one of the highlights of my life, it was definitely a pretty cool thing to have that access, that authority, that I could just flash my badge and walk past all these guys with M16s and walk right onto the trading floor. Even though I had no reason to be there whatsoever, I had access. But hundreds of others have had that access or have that access. Even though it's a small number, it's still a lot, relatively speaking. Jesus is about to demonstrate that he is the only one who has ever had and who, who currently has the authority to forgive. And he's going to do that by affirming his deity through this action of healing. He's going to do that by affirming his deity by what he's about to do. So he says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then again, I said this is like a parenthetical phrase that I believe Mark inserts in there. It says, hey, he's been talking to the scribes. Now he's turning and he's talking to the paralytic. He says, he said to the paralytic, I say to you. Now this is what he's just been kind of given as a hypothetical to the scribes. I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Again, anyone can say that. There's only one who ever has ever lived who someone would actually be able to get up. And you see in verse 12, and he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God. And it was a crowded house. And in my mind, you know, they couldn't get in the door to begin with. And in my mind, what I'm picturing is they're like, oh, let's get out of the way for this gentleman to walk right out of here. Because they can't believe what they've seen. It even says, we've never seen anything like this. Why? Because no one to that point had ever lived on this earth who could do that. He's the only one. But it's not, again, about just that man walking out of that house. It's about demonstrating that he is God with the power and the authority to forgive sins. To forgive sins. And that is what leads into where I want to end with this. And that's faith. It's the part I kind of skipped over in this story. It's definitely a story about power. Every one of those four things that I pointed out equals Jesus is God. Because only God could have done those four things, right? Does that make sense? But there's also a story in here about faith. I'm sure like you, I mean like me, many of you have heard about the houses, you know, what, what a house in Palestine would have looked like during the first century that... Many of them were flat roofs with a, with a staircase on the side to get to the top of the roof and all that. But what I see here is five individuals, four carrying and one paralytic, who were willing to go through a lot of obstacles to get to Jesus, right? Go back with me to verse 3. It says, And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. That in and of itself is not trivial. Four people carrying, uh, you know, the entire weight of a human. Um, that's not trivial. You, you know, who knows how far they came, but um, that's, not, that's not an easy task to do. But when they could not get near him because of the crowd. Now again, earlier Mark had said there were so many people that you couldn't even get in the door. Because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. So again, I'm no expert on this, but from what I read, you know, it was, it was typical of houses of that time to be the, the roofs to be made of a combination of, of straw and tile. And while probably wasn't built to be an audit, you know, a sunroof that you could disassemble and put back together real easy, that there would have been a way to you know take the pieces apart and get down through the roof, but but it would, again, not have been trivial. They had to carry this man upstairs, and these probably were not, you know, uh, these were probably not super wide steps that they were taking this man up. To get him up there, disassemble the roof. There's probably dust all falling down in, in the house while Jesus is teaching, and they're lowering him down through there. Again, none of this is easy. 
They're doing everything they possibly can because they look and say, hey, his biggest need is he needs to be able to walk and there's only one who can give it to him. And we're going to do whatever it takes to get to that one. Whatever it takes, we're going to get there. We're going to do everything we can. When they could not get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And we've already read this, verse 5, but we didn't focus on the first part. It says, when Jesus saw their faith. When he saw their faith. Doubtful they understood everything about the nature of who Jesus was and what he represented, but do we understand the, nature, the, the complete nature of who Jesus is and what he represents? We try, we do our best, but I fully believe that Jesus is beyond our comprehension, that God is beyond our comprehension, but they had faith in him. They believed in him, in his power. Again, didn't necessarily understand what his power was capable of, but they saw him as a source of power as a source of healing. And we can get into all kinds of discussions about, well, how could Jesus forgive the sins before he died and was crucified and had spilled his blood and all that, but that's a conversation for another day. It's about faith and forgiveness. They were willing to go through whatever it took to get to Jesus. Why were they willing to do that? Because they believed. They believed and it drove their actions. It drove their actions. It made them look at every obstacle they came upon and said, I'm willing to do what I have to do to get around over through that obstacle, to get to Jesus, to get to Jesus. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. It reminds me of another story uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. This is right after the Sermon on the Mount. Quite a few little cool stories there right after the Sermon on the Mount of interactions between Jesus and individuals. Um, the one I'm thinking of is the interaction between him and the centurion. A centurion is a Roman soldier in charge of a hundred soldiers. And do we remember what happened? This was also at Capernaum, same place. It says, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home. Another instance of someone being paralyzed, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. A Gentile, a Roman, but who demonstrates a humility before the creator of the universe in human form and who also recognizes his incredible power to where he doesn't even need to be in his home to heal the man. He demonstrates faith. He believes in Jesus, and he sought him out. And I think the message for us is that we should be asking ourselves the question, what are we doing to seek out Jesus? You know, at Pleasant View right now, I'm going through a series on Sunday mornings uh, focusing on the I am statements of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And one of the reasons why I love well, there's a lot of reasons why I love all those I am statements, like, you know, like I am the light of the world, I am the, the resurrection and the life, I am the way, the truth. We talked about one of them tonight. I'm, you know, the way, the truth, and the life. Every one of them, Jesus is saying, I am God. In every one of them. But in every one of them, Jesus is also saying something else. That your focus should be on me. Rather than anything else. You should know me. You know, you can get bogged down in all kinds of other things. Even in the work of the church, you can get bogged down in all kinds of things and lose sight of the true source of power. What Jesus wants more than anything is to have a relationship with each and every one of us. And then from that relationship, then we look to say, how do I, Lord, how do I serve you? But it doesn't work the other way around. You first have to have a relationship. Then you look to say, hey, how do I follow you, Jesus? How do I serve you? How do I live the way you want me to live? But it has to start with, with meeting Jesus, with having a relationship with him. And sometimes there are things that get in our way. Maybe not a crowded house that we can't get into, but there are things in life that get in our way of having a true and meaningful relationship with 
the Messiah, the Savior. And just like these five individuals, we have to ask ourselves, what am I willing to sacrifice? What am I willing to go around and over and through? What am I willing to give up so that I can have an audience with God himself? What am I willing to do? How much faith do I have that will, that will drive me to overcome those obstacles? I hope that that's a question we can, we can ruminate on coming out of this lesson, being reminded of his great power, reminded of how much we need him and how much that there is nothing in life that we should allow to get between us and our relationship with Jesus. Thanks for hanging with me tonight. Let's close with a prayer if we can. Almighty Father in heaven, Lord, Father, thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. Father, we thank you for the brothers and sisters that, that meet here. Father, we pray that you will bless the Bellevue Church, that you will bless uh, its leadership, that you will bless the members, Father, that you will bless them as they, they strive to grow closer to you and strive to reach this community. Father, thank you for this recording of this event in the life of your son when he was here on this earth. Thank you for the reminder of his power through the words that he spoke, through the forgiveness that he offered, through, through the miracles that he performed. Father, thank you so much that you sent him to die for us. And Father, may we be willing to give up anything that gets between us and having a relationship with your son. Pray that you will give us the courage to be representatives of him out in the midst of a lost and dying world uh, and that we will do everything we can to take others with us to eternity with you. Father, we thank you for his sacrifice that makes that confidence in eternity possible. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you all.